Thank you, Stephen, for the generous introduction. Before I start, as an Oxford alumni and member of Oxford Union, I would like to express my warmest welcome to today's guest speaker, Lieutenant General Nasser Khan Janjua, uh, to this historic union. I would like to thank him for accepting that invitation. President of Oxford Union, Stephen and his team, excellent students, let me begin by thank you, thanking all the proud and brave people who have fought against terrorism around the world, but you, like me, know who the real heroes are. Those brave servicemen and women, yours and ours, who fought the war and are still guiding us from the evil. And our acknowledgement to them should be measured in this way by showing them and their families, loved ones, that they did not strive or die in vain, but through their sacrifice, future generations can live in greater peace and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, terrorism is a global phenomenon Therefore, it is important that its nature is well understood and which then could help remove its understandings amongst partners and unite them against this common evil. Being a former student of Oxford, I have always believed in the universal principle of human spirit. The spread of freedom is the best reward for the free. It is the last line of defense in our first line of attack. And just as the terrorists seek to divide humanity in hate, so we have to unify in around an idea, and that idea is liberty and freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, we need the same spirit to face the evil of terror, which we all allied partners faced during World War II. The darkest period in human history could not break the will of Britain, nor its people. You remember that how Winston Churchill fought for his country's freedom and dignity. He said, I have nothing to offer but blood Tear, toil, and sweat. Victory at all costs, victory in spite of all the terror. Victory, however long and hard the way the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan and its partners have come a long way in achieving this great freedom through great sacrifices were made to maintain these universal principles. Freedom does not have any nationality. It is what we together struggle for, live for, strive for, and ultimately die for. Ladies and gentlemen, terrorism is a direct threat to this freedom. The terrorists and the actors that support them don't have large enemies, uh, armies, or precision missiles. They don't have, need them. Their weapon is chaos. For them, borders are irrelevant and destruction the ultimate goal. They are after our freedom, the jewel that we value the most. We cannot forget 9-11, we cannot forget London bombings, and definitely we cannot forget the terrorist attack on the innocent children of Army Public School Peshawar. Therefore, we should all come together and work together to eliminate this tent of terrorism. Now, I would like to hand over back to Stephen, and we would like to again invite Nasu Khan Jinjuga for his insight on today's talk. Thank you very much. I just take on. It's so good to be here. I'm so pleased to be here with all of you. I'm really honored, Mr. Stephen. And I want to thank this man who pushed me into it. And I wonder if you know this man, <laughs> this smart guy. He got me here. And I really have to thank you all who have come to attend this presentation. I'm really grateful to all of you. And I'm I'm really at a loss. What do I say? Where do I begin? The story of what love can be. <coughs> Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we are stuck in the war of narratives. There's so much happening in the world. 
So everyone is selling a narrative. And when we get fixed with those narratives, somehow we tend to have fixations. And from those fixations, we tend to have our grooves that we always remain into. And that is how we grow. While the students at Oxford University are growing and they are into development of their analytical skill. Therefore, I will suggest to them that while you have a narrative, you are convinced of somebody's narrative, but it is always good to listen to others. So on this note, that please listen to me as well, as my part of the story, we, we could be together discussing these things. And let me tell you, coming from Pakistan, I squarely want to put it, how are we seen? Then how we are? What is the reality check? And the security challenges faced by Pakistan and if time permits, we can talk of the future as well. So ladies and gentlemen, how are we seen? What are the general myths about Pakistan? The foremost is that we are a Muslim country and we are suffering of extremism. We are suffering of terrorism. We are an insecure country. We are a dangerous country. We are a nuclear country and our nuclear assets can fall in the hands of extremists. We are playing a double game. We are supporting Talibans and Haqqanis and Pakistan is linked to terrorist organizations providing them shelter and safe havens. This is what people think about us. I will conduct before you a reality check. And then I will relate with the recent history, role of Pakistan in former USSR coming to Afghanistan, then 9-11. Then I'll explain to you the situation in-house in Pakistan, that is Karachi and Blochistan. So to conduct a reality check, you would hardly go to Pakistan. You won't get a chance in this kind of an age. You may go in future. But I thought that I will take you to Pakistan by way of a pictorial coverage. So let me tell you, how do we look like? What is Pakistan? So ladies and gentlemen, if we can put off this light, so the slides will show better. This is father of nation. That's where he's buried. This is where we decided to make Pakistan. This is Islamabad. Islamabad. And let me take you up towards the north, but not to swear cold yet. So these are our northern areas. These fascinating places. This is all Pakistan. We are full of honeymoon spots. <laughs> but for that, you have to get married. Just anyone and everyone enjoys like this when they come to Pakistan. This is how we really look like. We are a fascinating country. We have bridges like this. So you have to walk. You have to walk with us. You have to boat with us. And this is how. And this is also Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen. Minus 50. Glaciated terrain. And I've been very lucky to have commanded this region. And you have to be there to believe this. This is how people live. Let's come down in the south. This is the landscape of the south. We have desert 50 plus. 
we have seas, <coughs> lakes, Gawadar. This is our Gawadar port. We have our Princess of Hope. We have Sphinx. This is what is our architecture, old architecture. This is very recent. Mohanjodaro, more than 5,000 old. Second largest salt mines, fourth largest production of mangoes, fourth largest producer of rice, cotton, milk, sugarcane, dates, mineral riches, coals, improving banking industry, trading routes, which can combine, connect whole of Asia. We have very well developed armed forces. Women have also started joining the armed forces. We have smart air force. The ladies could also be pilot in Pakistan Air Force. We have very good Navy. We are very often winning the gold medal of Cambrian patrol here. And what the British General Patrick had to say, the successes of Pakistan Army in war against terrorism. He said that Pakistan had made breathtaking gains against terrorism that is unmatched in over 150 years. We can ride horses, we can do tent pegging, we can play polo, we can play polo at the highest plane on the earth, Shandur. We can do buzkashi, we can make our bull to run. This is how our livestock is. Even our camels can dance. <laughs> Even our horses can dance. This is how our children look like. We are as modern as anyone. This is how young brides look like. Brides and grooms. This is how men can dance. You can blow pipe. We can beat drum, we can wrestle. We can be on the jeeps. We can box, we can play hockey. Women, squash, snookers, we have been champion. This is how girls play in the villages, the boys, in the family. Some of the animals, just I'm touching every area, just within two to three minutes, we can have embroidered shoes, bangles, ornaments, henna, which the women put and they look like this. <laughs> we can do carving on her. We can paint, good carpet industry. And this is the kind of buses we tend to have. <laughs> we can also be on the fashion ramp, but also 20% of our women are there representing women in all the parliaments. And we can also be like this. Let's come to some hard subjects now. And let's catch the bull from the horns. We will refer to USSR and then subsequently. This is, ladies and gentlemen, about Afghanistan. As a matter of history that I'm talking to you, today we want the best of the relationship with Russia, but I'm just referring to this as a matter of history. That we have a common tragedy with Afghanistan and Pakistan, this is what had happened. And unfortunately, children of Afghanistan have seen nothing but war since 1979. 
And today, Afghanistan has become the wound of the world that we all need to heal. And Pakistan is the next affected and worst affected country of perpetual war and instability in Afghanistan. And I feel that Pakistan and Afghanistan are partners in the pains and suffering. This started in 1979, when former USSR came to Afghanistan. The question, does Pakistan have to do anything with USSR coming to Afghanistan? No. Pakistan became the frontline state of US and the West. Pakistan stood along with Afghanistan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please try and understand that nobody sent their soldiers to fight USSR in Afghanistan. Who fought? Who fought? People of Afghanistan and people of Pakistan. And they were the ones who fought USSR. How? When the soldiers were not there, how? The concept of jihad was used, even misused. We were loaded with funds, we were loaded with money to open madaris and send them to fight USSR in Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just referring this as a matter of history only. If Pakistan did not stand with Afghanistan at that hour, could we hope to have a sovereign Afghanistan today? And again, as a matter of history, had Afghanistan caved in, God forbid, had Afghanistan caved in, Pakistan could have been next in the line. Pakistan and Afghanistan guaranteed each other's sovereignty. This is where the actual relationship of Pakistan and Afghanistan resides. And this is our commitment with Afghanistan. We are more of blood brothers, but misunderstood, suffering of distrust. And the larger question, if Pakistan did not stand with US, West, and Afghanistan. Could USSR be made to draw down from Afghanistan? Could the still the world be bipolar or unipolar? <coughs> if Pakistan, instead of fighting, had offered a trade corridor to USSR, could USA have been the only superpower today? If USSR did not, had not been dismembered, could the Berlin Wall fall? If USSR was not dismembered, could 14 countries, including Russian Federation, had become independent countries? This simply speaks of our role, commitment and sincerity. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the character and role of Pakistan for global and regional peace. Pakistan is a country which virtually helped alter the world order. What did we get? What did we get? This is what we got. And this had not really subsided that 9-11 knocked at our doors. Because Afghanistan had been left in a vacuum. After the dismemberment of USSR, Afghanistan had been left in a vacuum and just everyone went. And there was anarchy, there was political chaos, there was brutal 
intra-tribal wars to grab the power. Al-Qaeda and jihadi elements flown in at one time, entrenched themselves in Afghanistan, capitalizing on that vacuum. And one-time allies and friends of US turned against US and inflicted 9-11. What does Pakistan have to do with it? It is the unison of Taliban and Al-Qaeda which resulted in the rise of the monster of terrorism from Afghanistan challenging and jolting the world peace which inflicted 9-11. Now who left <coughs> Afghanistan in a vacuum and chaos from where rose the monster of terrorism to inflict 9-11? Was that of Pakistan's doing? No. The larger question, did Pakistan stand with those who inflicted 9-11 or with the world? We stood with the world and Pakistan provided what all it could. 9-11 was an event of international chaos which jolted the peace of the world. Not only that the US was undermined Everyone supported US to wage a war on Afghanistan. Pakistan made every endeavor to resolve the issue peacefully, but <coughs> could not avert the war. So ladies and gentlemen, this was a conflict in vengeance with no end state. Effects on Afghanistan, while Taliban regime was dismantled, using excessive force that injured the whole of the Afghan society and made the conflict rather perpetual. Taliban started to get the recruitment from the bereaved and injured society and are even flourishing force today. <coughs> and when it came to the first political dispensation in Afghanistan, now that we are trying to bring a Taliban to the table, want them to join the political processes. They were not made part of the first election. And had they been included in the political dispensation, would they have been counting votes or were they picking arms? Ladies and gentlemen, this was a great loss of opportunities. Taliban motivated masses and they motivated masses that we have to get Afghanistan liberated from the occupation forces. They named US and NATO as occupation forces. So this was their narrative. That is how they started to get the recruitment. And in order to prevent the use of Pakistani soil, when we moved to Fatah, the sympathizers of Afghan Taliban which later named themselves as Tariq e Taliban Pakistan, declared jihad against Pakistan for siding with non Muslims. They blamed us that we are siding with infidels, we are siding with non Muslims. Pakistan was blamed to have taken a U turn on Afghan policy. So the war came to Afghanistan, but what did Pakistan get? This is what Pakistan got as end result of war coming to Afghanistan. We had to lose the former Prime Minister. This is what happened with our Marriott, with our schools. When innocent 134 children of Army Public School were killed, this is what we got, drone attacks and millions were displaced. We were counted into most dangerous countries. But how did we respond as a nation? Before I come to that, let me introduce to you the border geography at least that you know that what are we faced with? 
when you go around the world, this is the kind of borders that you come across. Civilized people, cultured people, and sometimes an odd soldier could stand and guide. But with borders, this could also happen. These borders have to be surveilled continuously. Afghanistan-Pakistan border, 2611. What is the border geography? This is the height profile, ladies and gentlemen, between us and Afghanistan, that the highest point between us is 24,700 feet. Such high mountains are there. And this goes to level zero. But I want to fly with you and take you to Afghanistan border. And this is how is the terrain between us. How treacherous, how difficult is this terrain where more than 200,000 troops are deployed as of today. UK has 80,000 army. We have deployed two, more than 200,000 troops on this western border. Just look at this terrain. And then it's so hard. Who can come and sit with us and guard this kind of terrain and stop the infiltration? when there is no mechanism whatsoever, there is no barrier between us. This is how are our towns. This is how are our jungles, mountains. This is the landscape of Fata, this kind of snow. So hard to maintain troops. Then we have divided villages. There are villages if you are in the courtyard, you are in Pakistan. If you are in the bedroom, you are in Afghanistan. And at one point in time, when Durand line was marked, so it divided the villages, the clans, the tribes, the people. And at that time, to resolve the issue, Britishers introduced the easement rights. That okay, if your fields are on the other side, you can go and cultivate. No issue. Or your family is there, okay, you can go and meet them. So just a chit, easement rights. Anyone can come and go, no issue. So this is how, like brothers, we are living in the divided villages. These are our barriers. Look at it. It's only because we have lived like brothers. We have more than 3 million refugees and this is the kind of, you know, refugees camps, villages where they are living. Now in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, in one province, just look at the number of routes. There's just one established route where we have custom, frequented route 16, unfrequented 111. Total of 128 routes. The camels, the cattle, they come and go back in the evening. That is how we are living in Balochistan. So more than 60,000 people every day cross the border. And they come and go. Their economy is interlinked. And by way of calculation only, in last 15 years, whole of Afghanistan by way of their population, has visited Pakistan. By way of calculation only. And the easement rights that I was talking to you about. And welcome to Pakistan. Anyone, anytime coming from Afghanistan or going from Pakistan, welcome to Pakistan. So this treacherous terrain, this border geography, the easement rights, divided villages, you see, these are the loopholes which are being, you know, availed to the advantage of the terrorist. 
But how did we fight? Let me tell you. How did we fought? How did we fight? Pakistan was, you know, assailed in the north by the terrorists. Then the Balochistan was assailed and then Karachi. So these main three areas were under attack. How did we respond? First in the north, so this is FATA. This has seven agencies. Perpetually, ever since 9-11, we are into operations here. And back in 2008, insurgency was on real peak. And you look at the map, the red areas were under the terrorist control. Yellow areas were where we were contesting the control with terrorists. And all over the years, ever since then, then we launched a major operation called as Zarbe Azb. And we cleared these areas and we continued to fight in these areas. And then we secured these areas in 2014. And as of today, the terrorists have run to Afghanistan. And now they are there, they sneak in from there and they attack Pakistan. Now let me take you to Karachi. This is how Karachi looks like. We have had terrorism, target killing, extortion, kidnapping. We were into operations and we have brought it down. More than 90%. And the life has become normal in Karachi. In Balochistan, where I was commander myself, I consider myself fortunate that I was myself there. Look at Balochistan, that how big is Balochistan? It's 44% <coughs> of entire Pakistan. That whole of Pakistan is as good as Balochistan. Here, the Pakistani flag had been burnt and my canvas was full and it looked as if we are fighting an octopus. This is literally I felt. Please pay attention to this. This is, this is a miracle of Lochistan that I'm going to explain it to you. I was in search of this head of this octopus and what did I find? That it was failure to integrate Balochistan. It was also a failure to get integrated. So we were all committing mistakes, blunders. That is why fifth insurgency. So it was lack of integration. That their sense of deprivation was not being addressed. That is why they had turned into retaliations. That is why they had separatist tendencies. And that is how they had negative subnationalism. So virtually they were suffering of negative subnationalism. We don't stay with you. We want independent Balochistan. And that is why these things were happening. So eventually we found out that negative subnationalism resides in this head. Now, I refused to fight the legs. I was only fighting negative subnationalism and insurgency. What is the strategy I formulated? Those who were suffering of negative subnationalism, I gave them the nationalism. That means a hug, a love, and licking their wounds, addressing their sense of deprivation telling them that we belong to each other, holding them close, bringing them close, and selective use of force. So that when this negative subnationalism is done, the people who are convinced and they will stop these insurgents not to fight. So for this, ladies and gentlemen, this is the strategy, the military strategy that I made. And I gave them a slogan. 
जीवे जीवे बलोचिस्तान लॉन्ग लिव बलोचिस्तान एंड जीवे जीवे पाकिस्तान बिकॉज यू लिव फर्स्ट देन वी लिव सो वैल्यूइंग पीपल एंड विद दिस काइंड ऑफ लव दैट आई गेव टू पीपल एंड वेन आई हक देम सो दे स्टार्टेड थ्रोइंग द वेपन्स दे स्टार्टेड सरेंडरिंग एंड दैट मिसिंग पर्सन डेड बॉडीज नेरेटिव so even the chief justice of the province came out and came out and met a school which i had opened for the terrorist children after i got them from the jail and put them into a school and named it as a hopes umeed no the new hope and even the chief justice of the province came and met these children and was with them so within two and a half years a place where pakistan's flag had been burnt Pakistan flags was everywhere so we won peace not war this was power of love and ladies and gentlemen we have paid a huge price we have buried our near ones dear ones to the tune of 60000 22000 soldiers and all ranks particularly the senior ranks have laid their life and we have dismantled infrastructure of terrorist and look at the tunnels that they had prepared nothing would affect them no artillery no air force this is how they were living this is how was their torture center this is how they had made a heaven on earth and convincing terrorist that they they that is where they will go and this was their training infrastructure they had proper books and they made use of every gadgetry that was available and we were then also into pacification this is pakistan army chief hugging people and then we were developing the area the affected area licking the wounds of these people and bringing them a better life this is what we have been doing the destroyed schools have been you know rebuilt reconstructed the hospitals so we are reconstructing we are and that dangerous country the country suffering of terrorism you know all the graphs have started to come down and in all these areas we are now in you know consolidating phase and we have no started off with another operation which is called as raddul fasad this is what we could do for the global peace regional peace not the blame game ladies and gentlemen let's face it squarely pakistan is blamed to be playing a double game how us is blaming pakistan for siding with taliban and haqqanis Taliban Pakistan is blaming Pakistan for siding the US and the West and the non-Muslims. We are in the middle of the blame. Both sides are opposing us. Both sides are blaming us. Okay. If Pakistan is supporting Taliban and Haqqanis as per US blame, that means Pakistan is supporting Muslims and not infidels. point to ponder please think if pakistan as blamed is supporting taliban and haqqanis so pakistan is supporting muslims and not infidels then why ttp is fighting with pakistan because we are supporting muslims as per the blame if pakistan is supporting taliban and haqqanis that implies pakistan taliban sakanis are one side isn't it then why pakistan could not use them to influence ttp to stop fighting because they are cousins of each other why pakistan has lost 60000 lives are we mad why couldn't we use taliban afghan taliban and sakanis to stop those taliban who are fighting with us why have we killed 
1100 and arrested 600 Al Qaeda terrorists. If to top it all, our own people are also blaming Pakistan for taking a U turn on Afghanistan. So, ladies and gentlemen, 60,000 lives have been lost. And we are in the middle of blames. It's a strategic haze and confusion. It's a dirty war. It's a dirty war which has come to our homes and even our children are not safe of it. As I said, everyone is selling his own narratives and we are in the war of narratives. And Pakistan is seen through the prism of failure of Afghanistan. And what is happening in Afghanistan? Pre 9-11, Taliban were fighting with the Northern Alliance. And post 9-11, Northern Alliance is fighting with Taliban. What is it? So two cousins are fighting. What do we do? Pakistan fights TTP, prevent use of own soil, prevent cross-border movement, prevent fighting war, Afghan war in Pakistan. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, it's commonly said, victory has many fathers, defeat is orphan. Unfortunately, collectively, we have not been able to win the war in Afghanistan. And it has become perpetual. Because this was initiated in vengeance. There was lack of political and public support to it. NATO and US, as per Taliban, were taken, unfortunately, as aggressors, as occupiers, occupation forces. Unfortunately, US was distracted by Iraq. Military strategy has always been on the lead. There have been isolated militaries. I have known militaries paying bribes in the name of winning hearts and minds. They are gallant Afghan forces. But it is it's their capacity. It's too early for them. And when Mr. Obama said that we are there in Afghanistan until 2011, then 2014, Taliban said, you have the watch, we have the time. So prior to the closure of the conflict in Afghanistan, there was a large drawdown. Everyone went back. Because there was change of administration in US. There was a political change. So there was a drawdown. There was a huge vacuum, military vacuum. And the advantage went to Taliban. This is how it is said that 40 to 44 percent of Afghanistan is under control Taliban. What do we have to do with this? If Taliban have such a control in Afghanistan, why do they need Pakistan? And BBC says that 70 percent of area Taliban can come and go. Whom do we blame for such strategic shortfalls? Ladies and gentlemen, we are victim country suffering of terrorism along with Afghanistan and we feel that we are mis misunderstood and we are underestimated country while we are correct and very resilient nation. I say that Pakistan is a morally correct country and on the right side of the history. Whatever is happening in the world, in the Middle East, we are not part of any conflict. We are not part of any situation. We are balanced. Whatever is happening around the world, we are pursuing that politically. We are making maximum contributions for UN. And on the nuclear weapons, you see what, what was said by DG IAEA in this march. Your country is experienced user of peaceful nuclear technology. Everywhere, I was clear, you have the knowledge and the pool of people who are dedicated to do the job. The NSG, nuclear supply group, would be better off with Pakistan inside rather than outside. Just a word on Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, we are trying to win the war in Afghanistan. I would like to say to end the sufferings of Afghanistan and its people, let's seek the closure of the conflict instead of winning it. And the cousins should stop fighting in Afghanistan. They need to forgive each other. 
I do not know how much time I have done. It's a good time to move to questions now, if, if appropriate. Okay. I, I had something on the future, but can I have one and a half minute? Okay. <laughs> Let me talk to you about the future. Here is the world map. Please have a look at it and I show you the population of the world. What is the population? 60% of population resides in Asia. The next highest is in Africa, 16.5. Then Europe, 9.8. Then South America and then North America and Australia is 0.5%. So this is what is the world which tells you the population. And usually it is said, love is where the heart is. So where are the people? It is Asia. It is the maximum human resource, consumer markets, manufacturing, natural resources, development scope, connectivity. That resides in Asia. Actually the world is here. Because people are there. And if you try and connect this, just look at this. World map, the north is frozen, Pacific is too far, <laughs> Atlantic connects <laughs> minimum people, Indian Ocean provides the main connectivity. Okay, you try and connect Europe with America, how many percentage of people? So, Europe and Asia are already connected. 60%, 9%, that means 70% of the world is already connected. That makes the concept of Eurasia. And Eurasia and Africa are co-located, the maximum population. So who provides the largest connectivity to Eurasia and Africa? It's Pakistan. Pakistan connects more than 85% of the world. Just look at the map of Pakistan. If you look at Pakistan, Pakistan, all the roads go and come to Pakistan. And where is the future economic block? Asia. That's why CPAC. So Pakistan is one country which will actually connect the larger part of this world, which will also connect up to Africa. Pakistan will bring the world together. Pakistan will connect the markets of Eurasia, Africa and the world. And Pakistan will become a massive trade corridor. It will be a massive trade hub, economic hub, and all that is there that we, we have. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this time Pakistan will help to improve the whole of the world by way of economy, by way of cooperation. Pakistan has anything and everything. We will bring the world together. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for this overview and explanation. It was very interesting. Uh, I want to begin by asking about the uh, political influence of the military uh, in Pakistan. Um, as, of course, the historic suggestion that there is a power struggle between civilian government and also the military. Uh, do you think that the influence has extended too far? Or is Pakistan now in a healthy balance of democracy with a strong military? Usually, civil-military relationship uh, is quite talked about an issue in Pakistan. And I tell you why. Somehow, 
in Pakistan, we have really not grappled the art of governance. Governance, that means ensuring the well-being of the people. So every now and then, whenever there's a situation, people start to look towards the army. So it is with those hopes that they stare at the army, they do something. So civil and military and the people. So basically, both sides they want to do better. And in this process, there are impressions which are exaggerated about the interference and there are some legitimate things happening between them which as national security advisor I have seen that things get resolved very amicably and I think gradually we are improving uh, this dimension uh, of our country the civil military relationship and very recently you see that they're sitting together we also have a National Security Committee forum where we can sit together and talk to each other. So I think democracy is to flourish in Pakistan, as we say, inshallah. Of course, as National Security Advisor, you had a dual role in bringing both the military perspective to civilian democratic governance and vice versa. Um, can you comment on what it was like to work with Prime Minister Sharif uh, and what the successes you felt were of his premiership? Oh, it wasn't a dual role. <laughs> it was one state role because as national security advisor, you belong to everyone. So you, you, you belong to the children. You belong to the coming generations as national security advisor. Because as you know that people now have become the stakeholders of the security. And it is said that if people are not secure, how the country can be secure? So I was... I was not politically affiliated as such and I was doing uh, whatever was there to do for the country and its security and I'm sure I got the full support from the political government also and from the military also and from my experience of Balochistan the way I went around people were also very very supportive of me and uh, I could I could play my inning well that's what I have that kind of satisfaction. Um, and moving away from Afghanistan to the other side, uh, I want to ask about uh, if you think there is the potential. You've talked about compromise and reconciliation with India as a necessary step towards the peace of the region and prosperity. Uh, what do you think the biggest obstacles are for Pakistani security and national strategy in terms of implementing a reconciled strategy? I think the biggest thing is our mindset. Uh, since we both have become now a nuclear country, so we need to rethink about our relationship. And I would say that both of us should sit together and ask questions. Can we be enemy forever? Particularly so that we have become nuclear. So both of us would find the answer, no. If you found the answer, no, where do we go? So the best would be to sit together, to resolve our disputes. And by way of resolving our disputes, we need to get out of past and belong to the future. And then the next question is, who would do it? Do we do it ourselves? Or we leave it to our children because they would be that much wise to do it. So better would be that we should do it ourselves. And the last thing on India and Pakistan, since both of them are nuclear countries, I would like to say that if we can't be friends, let's not be enemies. Because that is a sure recipe of disaster. So all of us we have to rethink 
and we have to learn how to manage our relationship and we should stop being unkind to each other because it is not helping us anyway. Let's take some questions from the audience. Um, please, let's first go to the gentleman here in the second row in the blue shirt. You just want to wait for the microphone to come to you, please. Sir, your commitment to peace between India and Pakistan seems creditable, but is it backed up by the actions of Pakistan? For example, you spoke a lot about terrorism on the other border. What about 2611? Why not hold Hafiz Saeed and um, JUD responsible? Pakistan has run special trains to JUD events. Now, what is JUD? JUD has been declared by the UN, by USA, by Russia, by India, and organizations around the world as a terrorist organization responsible for 2611. So why does Pakistan continue to support JUD if they are truly committed to peace? Also, why was Hafiz Saeed released? He, this is a man who is responsible for 2611, as said by the terrorist who was captured after 2611. And the US has placed a 10 million bounty on his head. This is a terrorist, but yet he was released from Pakistani prison. And Pakistan refuses, then continues to support JUD, refuses to hand over Hafiz Saeed, and refuses to engage on Dawood Ibrahim, for example, who was responsible for the 1992 bombings. So if Pakistan is truly committed to anti-terrorism and to peace in the region, why do they still continue with these activities? Thank you very much. You know, these are the areas which really need answers between us. You definitely have this question. And uh, when we try and execute these things, so we virtually have no proofs on ground. Because what happens? Such like things have no proofs. And when we ask for those proofs, those are, those are not made available. And there's a cooperation. And then there's again a hiccup. And there, there's multiplicity, duplicity in these things. There are gray areas which, of course, the select group should sit together. And uh, I have been doing this. But those things have not been made available that you are able to you know, conduct a proper trial and punish someone. All the rules, all the regulations we have tried to apply, there's hardly anything that comes around as a proof. So it is difficult. And we have been, you know, using all our authority, the government using its authority and putting them behind bars. But then when it is in the judicial system, there are not enough proofs. So judiciary per force is also, you see, when they are not provided with those kind of proofs, so they let them. You know. I'm sorry, sir, that's not entirely fair. There is enough proof that Hafiz Saeed was responsible for 2611. There are quotes from uh, Ajmal Kasab, who was the terrorist who was captured, and there is um, hard data that has linked him to the terrorist attacks. Uh, my dear, actually, what you feel, uh, what you know, and that is how what you say seems correct to you. I have handled these things. Trust me, these are the things which are not available, which are not being made available. And now even there are certain books which have also emerged as who killed uh, Karare or what? Uh, and then the betrayal of, and the fingers have started to point elsewhere also. What I am trying to tell is, and then if it relates to Kashmir, <coughs> you know, it is that much difficult because there's a legitimate issue between Pakistan and India, which is not being addressed by way of talking. So all those who are linked, connected with Kashmir, Kashmir cause, they see no hopes because the bilateralism has been defeated between us. If we can sit, if we can talk, so the solutions can be found to these things also. And we need to do that collectively. Because when you say uh, Mumbai, so Pakistan side says Samjota Express. What happened to them? So I think both sides need to sit together and seriously carve the way forward with that good spirit. Uh, 
that I've just mentioned that let's not be enemy forever. Great, thank you very much. Next question, please. Yes, let's go to the uh, gentleman here in the blue jumper and glasses. Thank you for the talk, General. <coughs> Uh, you led a delegation to Kabul earlier in March this year. I wanted to ask you about that. And uh, what narrative did you pick from the Kabul officials about the Durand line? Because uh, from what I know, most of them don't actually recognize the current border. And I think that's one of the biggest issues between Pakistan and Afghanistan and the, the reason for the, the, the struggle. And also, uh, you said that uh, Pakistan has lost 66,000 people to terrorism. But why was Mullah Brother released from prison and lives in his house in Karachi around uh, well, two weeks ago? Uh, and uh, if you think he was innocent, why was he in prison for six years as well? I wanted to, to comment who, on that. Who, please? M Mullah Brother, one of the founders of Taliban, he was released two weeks ago. I just want to take a comment on that because if you, uh, if if the state is imprisoning people for uh, without any evidence for, for and accuses them of terrorism, that's not fair. And if uh, he was a terrorist, why was he released? And also, why are all the leaders of the Taliban, including Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda, found, was found in uh, Pakistan? And and uh, uh, do you think there is some like truth to the accusation that Pakistan receives from the international community about supporting terrorism? I mean, they, they don't have they, they don't just make up this statement from like air and. I think there's probably enough of a Pakistan. question to respond to. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> so, how many questions have you asked? Uh, you started off with losing 60,000 people? Well, unfortunately, yes. But if you ask me, my heart is equally painful. It is pained whereby Afghanistan loses every day, on the average, 60 to 80 people. And this is so heart-wrenching, so heartbreaking, that it is not only those 60 to 80 people, because since we have carried the heaviest of the coffins, which are smallest in the size, we know the pain. So your pain and our pain is common, but it's so unfortunate that we are being misunderstood. And this too shall pass, uh, because at the heart of it, uh, we are nothing but brothers. This is my experience of 40 years in the armed forces and three years as national security advisor. My going to Afghanistan uh, was, of course, retrieving this relationship. And uh, I'm very grateful to my counterpart, Honorable Hanif Atmar, uh, national security advisor, who has resigned. I, I met Honorable President Ashraf Ghani and we have had very rewarding uh, discussions and way forward. And uh, we were able to evolve and finalize uh, an agreement called as APAPS, which talks of Pakistan and Afghanistan solidarity. That was name given by Chief of Army Staff of Pakistan. So that works in five areas, at the strategic level, political level, the military level, the intelligence level, and the border level, that we have to collectively work together. And we have to help each other. Mullah brother, we released much earlier also, he refused to go. Afghanistan wanted that he should be released, so we, we released. And that was to, you know, to create that trust. And uh, there are wheels within wheels. We all have to sit together, work together. And more than anyone else, Pakistan and Afghanistan have to sit together and in an environment of, you know, based on trust. Because as of today, Afghanistan, unfortunately, has become a playground whereby the regional countries are serving their own angles, the global countries are serving their own angles. And it is at the cost of Afghanistan's people. And not today, but since last 40 years. 
So my dear, I, I have, my heart is full of sympathy for Afghanistan. I've been to your beautiful country more than 30 times. Every time I have tried to open one riddle and bring the peace closer. So this is what we have to do. But who is fighting in Afghanistan? Can you point out who is fighting in Afghanistan? So there are cousins who are fighting among themselves. It is infighting. It is that absence and lack of reconciliation within. Post, oh, sorry, pre 9-11, uh, Taliban were fighting because they had Kabul, they were fighting Northern Alliance. Now Northern Alliance has Kabul. Now they are fighting Taliban. So I hope that two sides can reconcile. What do we have to do? Can we bring Taliban to London? Can we bring Taliban to Lahore, New York? That is an unsettled energy of Afghanistan. That must settle there. So they have to resolve things among themselves. The earlier they do it, better it would be for the people of Afghanistan. That's how I feel. Thank you. Let's take one final question. Go to the uh, gentleman in the front row here. No, ask me bitter questions. It won't be that bitter, but it's more just a general one based on some of the ones we've heard today. It's what does success look like for Pakistan? So you've mentioned America invading Afghanistan, Iraq, thing, countries that had nothing to do with 9-11. We've had questions about uh, how India uh, perceives Pakistan's actions, about Afghanistan, how Pakistan now harbors six million refugees, yet it's very hard to keep everyone happy. So what does success actually look for? Like, uh, look like? For I don't really don't envy your job because there are so many different stakeholders. But what does success look like for Pakistan as an individual country, not bearing in mind all these other vested interests? I think uh, success and succeeding alone, that is not what, is what we should look at. The region is in turmoil. So we have to collectively Think for the collective success. Nobody should serve their own angle. Nobody. And everyone should help Afghanistan. Because Afghanistan today has become a wound of the world. <coughs> Just look at it. 40 years. Why? What fault? Any plausible reason. Why are we suffering? What for? So I think it's, it's not, it, is, it goes far beyond Pakistan. So this is one, one conflict in which whole of the world must win. This has to be concern of whole of the world. The whole of the world must heal this wound. So the success of the world will also be Pakistan's success. Success of Afghanistan's people should be success of Pakistani people. So, but success would be when people of Afghanistan are safe, secure. They have reconciled and they are not fighting among themselves and they are on the way of progression. That would be a greatest success. And that success will transit to Pakistan as well. Good enough. We are happy if Afghanistan is, you know, healed. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Jamal Somebody, Jandira. somebody still, but so I don't we know. Should, we should conclude there. Thank you very much. Uh, I very much appreciate you taking the time to speak with us here. It's fascinating to hear your insights and to hear a variety of questions and perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you.